Okay. That'll work. Okay, so our topic for today is value chains and how to squeeze a little bit more for your farm. Right? And I, I remember I think when we first started, someone said, uh, when I explained kind of the purpose of the class, someone said, oh, that's, you know, eliminate the middleman. And that is kind of what we're doing, but of course there's lots of middlemen and you don't necessarily want to get rid of all of them. You want to figure out, you know, who is it that's getting the most and, and, the and squeeze. Well, except that if you become the middleman, like under what circumstances uh, does that work? So what we're going to do is going to look at a little bit of history of how agriculture in the past has tried to do that and we're going to look at a little bit going forward and learn a little just the tiniest little hint of economic theory just so we kind of get it all okay so and if i use really big words you're allowed to throw a little stuff at me sure so within the, the key concepts we have here are the idea of a value chain and how traditionally that would have worked in agriculture and how that works in the modern era, what value capture or recapture means, and what that great big university word disintermediation means. Anyone want to guess? Disintermediation. Eliminating intermediation. Yeah, so not having intermediates. Yeah, get rid of middleman. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, so it's just a fancy word for not having a middleman or middle person. So when we think about what a value chain is, these are networks of interactions or, or strategic partnerships between businesses that when they're working well, create more value for the final consumer than any one of those companies can do on its own. So something like, you know, a uh, combine harvester. The number of different companies that have made or participated in the design and so on of that machine would boggle your mind, right? Uh, even something like the alternator in that machine probably has multiple uh, companies supplying parts and where did the copper come from and where did the aluminum housing come from and all that stuff, right? So that in some cases, a complex machine might have thousands of intermediate suppliers and, and participants. And by all of those groups working together on individually negotiated agreements, you can get a better, cheaper machine than you would if one guy was trying to build it in his backyard. You can break that chain into steps. And I think, you know, we think about, you know, why do we call it a value chain and not a value rope? It's because we want to imagine very distinct pieces of it that tie together. So in the pre-production phase, you have all the suppliers for your farm, and that can include uh, suppliers of, of raw product, but also could include things like uh, agrology advice, financial advice, financial services, uh, includes the development of the regulatory environment and any support structures that the farm relies on. 
then you get the actual production phase. And uh, I know the, the producers in my little farm association, even though we're a, really a marketing organization, uh, they love, whenever we have a conference, the suggested topics are always production. Let's, let's talk more about it. how to grow better t tomatoes. And uh, we look, you know, all of us love to focus on the production side of it, but it's, it is only one of the important value steps. And then post-production, that's everything that happens after it's produced, you know, storage, transportation, sales, uh, might include uh, contracts and so on, and then uh, probably arrive somewhere where further processing is done, at least some packaging, and then it reaches the consumer. Just as an aside, you often hear people, you know, in this building in the Faculty of Agriculture, talk about you know what consumers want, and I'm always just a little bit perplexed, like who's for the, for the wheat that your farm grows, who's the consumer? It's really the grain buyer at some desk somewhere, right? That's who you're selling to. That person has a consumer that's probably a mill or a processor, and then that person has a consumer that might be the actual producer of the good that is eventually purchased by someone who's gonna eat it, right? There's so many steps in there. And so it ends up looking like this. And this is I uh, produced uh, in Finland for thinking about how agriculture works there. But it's the same everywhere. So you have the green is the farm production. And everything after is typically other people. And the, the challenge is, can we skip directly to here? Can your farm produce the kind of thing that, uh, you, that a consumer wants and would pay a fair price for? And then all the intermediate value, you, the farm gets to keep. The challenge is a lot of those steps create huge efficiencies. Right? So that when some mill outside of Toronto is you know grinding a train load of wheat every day and, and selling it to the entire you know 20 million people that live there uh, they have a, an efficiency that's going to be very hard for you hand cranking something in your backyard to compete with and so it's true that a higher percentage of the final value goes back to the farm but it's not always the case that means that there's more money for the farm because of the efficiencies that uh, chains of value can create. And so uh, that's kind of the gist of what I want to get at today is just because you eliminate the middleman doesn't automatically mean you're going to make more money. Because that middle person is probably scaled in a way that your individual farm is going to have a hard time competing. So you can't just disintermediate, you can't just get rid of that intermediary, you have to rethink the process in a more efficient way. So, so one thing, and I guess another lesson is it's tempting to say, well, we didn't always have intermediaries, so can't we just take a step back in time, at least metaphorically, and get to a point in agriculture where the farmer sold everything uh, directly. And there are places in the world where that largely still happens. So uh, I think you, some of you that are in my uh, FMA group heard me talk about the farm I worked with a student from India on some years ago, and nearly all that raw product was sold at the end of the lane. You know, they produced rice and guava and wheat, and it was sacked up on the farm and there was a store at the end of the lane, and whenever they had stuff to sell, they'd raise a little flag, and everyone in the surrounding community would come and buy. And uh, it was tremendously efficient from a marketing perspective. And so we can think about what things look like 
before value chains existed, well, if, if, you, if you disintermediate everything, that includes things like the, the money supply. Right? So you have to think, well, we will really go back to step one, now we're back to trading good for good. I've got a sack of wheat and I need a service or a good from you in return. And why don't we still do it that way? And because economically speaking, it's highly inefficient. Because right? not everyone needs, no, I will put it this way, not everyone produces something you want. You've got all kinds of sacks of grain but not everyone has something that your farm needs. And the efficiency of finding, imagine there being a lawyer who is really good at getting you off the hook in some, some sort of medieval court process, and yet uh, needs to find, to buy a sack of wheat, we'd have to find a farmer who's in trouble with the law, right? That's massively inefficient instead of trading his services for one form of barter and, and bartering for something else. So the economic efficiency uh, that we have is kind of this romantic idea of the purity of agriculture, uh, I don't think that works economically. Some things barter very well and other things do not. So for instance, if you've ever had the expression, a person is worth their salt, that comes from the Roman practice of paying their soldiers in salt, because salt is something that you can divide. It essentially became a form of currency, right? If someone gives you a pound of salt and you need a loaf of bread, you can trade that to the breaker for not the entire pound, but a portion of it. So the divisibility of, of a, a currency is, is important. Not that long ago, just a little under 100 years ago, the barter in agriculture came back with a vengeance when, due to economic mismanagement, uh, the agriculture economy collapsed and there was no money. Cash became largely, not as in other places in the world it was a bit different, but in North America, that cash became unavailable rather than valueless. And so, uh, you know, we, this is not uh, strange to us. So what did that look like in a traditional value chain? We can imagine, well, maybe we have some form of currency, whether it be a divisible good or an actual item like a money. And that allows you to have, um, you know, people whose job it is to sell and buy uh, eventually, you know, you have markets, probably traditionally an open air type of environment with sacks of goods that are available for sale. And the suppliers tend to be located close, and although not always the case, right? Things like silk and spices traveled uh, thousands of miles across the world, even before barters ex uh, had it sought as a form of exchange. The information flow in those types of situations tends to be very uh, one-sided, so that the, uh, the traders will tend to have a much better idea of what's in demand and what's not than either the, the producers or the consumers. And each participant is, typically sp speaking, motivated to uh, get the most they can for the least amount of money rather than maximizing some of the quality. So in that kind of situation, uh, having a primary uh, producer having a premium market is very difficult. And so you can, when you think about how that was set up, you understand how over time, we have typically adopted a market environment where transparency is enforced, right? So that trades are made in a public uh, place. Uh, it's online these days, but the information is public. And so everyone knows who's buying and who's selling. And that increases uh, the price return to the people at the ends of the spectrum, uh, at the ends of the production chain, 
because they have more information. They can make better decisions about when they, for instance, time their cell. So, a traditional value chain tend to have very few steps, very few intermediaries, and so the value of the good is split relatively few ways. Absolutely no guarantee that farmers did well in that environment because they had no way of knowing if their share of it was, was correct, right? In economic theory, if a person's buying and a person's selling, and they both know everything, they'll take the net profit available and split it in half and both get happy with it, right? Uh, when you have information that's not available, then that starts to take one way or the other. And then you, have, you start to include things like the desperation of the producer to need to sell and so on. So, you know, when the, the feudal lord is saying, you gotta pay your taxes by the end of the week, or we're gonna cut your head off, you're a pretty motivated seller even if the price isn't fair. So in a modern chain, we tend to have lots of coordination. The, there's communication between the producers and the purchasers on things like forward contracts, right? That's a very strong signal as to what's needed in the marketplace. In some cases, uh, that, that production is either directly contracted by the end user or uh, and we're now starting to see uh, some production actually done uh, by the end users. So something like maple leaf, you know, owning or renting barns and owning the pigs. The supply base also tends to be highly coordinated. And part of that is the wide use of standards throughout the chain. Right, so people know what, for instance, when you're buying a specific chemical or fertilizer, exactly what its properties are. You're selling a, a load of wheat, exactly what its uh, qualities are. And those mechanisms tend to provide stability and efficiency, economic efficiency, that make this a stronger chain, even though it's longer than the very short ones. So when I'm advocating to a producer, well, you know, you should eliminate the middleman. I'm saying, like, that's not in itself a guarantee of anything. Right? You might be taking on a whole new set of problems. So, uh, but generally speaking, these long value chains have resulted in economic growth, better paying, better working conditions than that provided by a traditional agriculture economic base. And I think I have a table for that. Oh, yeah, the same table with that, right? So, uh, you know, different people specialized and different companies specialized in all those different tasks results in a efficiency that creates, uh, quite frankly, more money for everyone than would have been experienced, uh, you know, in the old days of trying to trade your wheat for something. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, everything is perfect either. Okay? The total percentage of the final value is reduced for the producer because there's so many more people who want a piece of that. It's also very resource dependent and very consumptive. Right? The energy and the human and physical resources needed to produce, to run that chain are significant. So a much more uh, expense and resource use for transportation. Typically a longer chain produces more waste. Uh, every step seems to waste some. There was a book called, I think, uh, something like The Onion, where they went from an on, you know, the number of onions picked on a farm to the number that actually hit a grocery store shelf. In some cases it was below 30%. That the, the spoilage and loss on you know, handling and sorting and everything was massive. Um, so where, where we have tend to have shorter uh, production chains, uh, there tends to be much less waste 
at um, uh, of the product. The, uh, another factor is as these chains become more complex, the increased amount of processing in this food tends to reduce its overall nutrient value. And that's something that I think we've, our, our society is gradually thinking about more, right? We have part of this faculty that, you know, agriculture and human nutrition, uh, our food science, uh, those folks think a lot about how do we make as good a food product with a higher nutrient quality instead of just having it be salt and sugar. So we add all this up. You know, uh, we think about for any type of thing, right, you have uh, different strengths and weaknesses. So a modern supply chain tends to have a great amount of communication uh, and it's driven by uh, you know what the consumer wants rather than what the farm can produce and so on so as you're thinking about your individual um, your individual farm product so for instance the supply source like the modern supply chain has terrific uh, methods and procedures for tracking back, say, like if you go to the, my product, the honey, if you go to, to the uh, to Super Value and buy that, there's little lot numbers on the back, and through their documentation, can trace that honey back to my farm. Whereas if I'm just selling it on a roadside stand, that kind of, that kind of traceability isn't there. The weird thing is that's not the impression the consumer has, right? The, the consumer, because they can't read those barcodes and those little, those little lot numbers and so on, they don't know that that's traceable to an individual farmer. They tend to see it as, you know, just this source of honey. And that has led to some consumer concern about food quality. Because it looks, it looks they don't know that it's as traceable as it is. And so I would suggest that uh, since that is a concern for consumers that that's probably part of your marketing plan to not just be, yeah, I'm just some Joe Schmo on the side of the road, but rather you have a very clear, uh, you, know, under, you know, branding and traceability aspect so that this, and that's some of why some producers have gone to something like organic product, right? Because then there's, it's really clear to the consumer what that product has done to it. Yeah. Um, so that uh, the organic uh, movement is at least partly about consumer information. So I would, I would encourage all of you to think deeply about your food product uh, that you're applying to the market. How is it that you're gonna satisfy the consumer's appetite not only for the food, but for the, the security that they want to feel about that. And really, what we really want is to have it both ways. I want all the things I'm buying for my farm, the fuel, the raw, the fertilizer, the uh, probably even some of the you know, human resources. I want that to be in a transparent marketplace there's lots of competition and I pay no more than I have to. But then I want to sell my product in a sort of market, uh, consumer driven uh, marketplace where I have all the information the consumer has to kind of take my word for it. And uh, there's a tension there, right? Everyone wants to be in a transparent marketplace, but uh, for their purchases, but everyone's being in a, in, a, in a private marketplace for their product. So when you're thinking about what you're selling, how it is, how would, how would you get it both ways for your farm? And we can think. Uh, let's pick up on the let's pick on the people that aren't here. Christmas tree farm. How does that marketplace work? 
Is that is that publicly traded in a in a marketplace where every tree is priced in a way that you all know? No, it's just you know. Pick one. Pick pick one and take your chances, right? And then you either go back to the same farm next year or forget, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Producers wouldn't want to haul Christmas trees to Patterson. <laughs> I'll bet on the U.S. East Coast there is a supply chain for Christmas trees. They all come out of New Brunswick and Quebec and they get shipped down and sold all across the heavily populated areas of, of the U.S. East Coast. And so there are people who produce Christmas trees as a bulk commodity and are probably taking contracts for hundreds of thousands of trees. Wow. But, and and now, our student in this course doesn't want to participate in that because that's going to be super cut through, yeah. right? They want to sell one tree to one consumer who wants to pay the full, you know, Christmas tree lot at the end of the lane price, but the farm gets all of it. We can talk a little bit about what this has looked like for Western Canadian agriculture. So, and I picked this one because you, some of you guys are interested in milling. So what does that look like? So that is the former Ogilvy or the Five Roses uh, flour mill here in Winnipeg. I don't know if it's still standing or not. There was, there was a fire there a few years ago. I think it finally came down. Uh, but, so the Ogilvy company uh, built the first uh, railway or trackside elevator in 1881 and built a uh, very large mill in Winnipeg the next year. So they want to do a thousand barrels of wheat a day. That's what that, what that means. And to get access to that much wheat, they built elevators and buying stations all across Western Canada where they thought the right kind of wheat was going to be available. And so there, they sent people out to buy wheat and built the infrastructure to do that. And it was seen by the company as a worthwhile investment, right? They weren't in the business of, oh, we want to serve farmers better, so we're going to build elevators. <laughs> we want the wheat. That's why we're building elevators. And also, they realized that these elevators could be places from which farmers could buy some of the things they needed, whether it be seed. Uh, probably in those early days, it wasn't fertilizer wasn't a concern, but probably some basic farm equipment and so on. And also, those elevator agents had a job of keeping the central company informed as to how the crop was progressing. So notice that the Ogilvy Milling Company knew way more about what the wheat crop looked like in Western Canada than any farmer. And so they had a market advantage. So uh, notice this is not in the farmer's interest. They kept their prices secret. You had no way of knowing what elevators in other parts of the country were, were paying, even on the same day. Uh, and there was a big scandal when a telegraph operator who was sent given that I probably the daily job of sending prices out to the elevators, let slip uh, how different places were pricing differently. And um, there was also some government regulation about uh, subsidies that railways had uh, received, and there was a big scandal. And so it was assumed in the economic analysis, if you guys take a business in a, in a degree, you might even a, a classic case that Angus people look at. Uh, did what that company, uh, how that company sourced its grain, did it affect Manitoba wheat prices? And it's pretty clear that it did. They could make uh, decisions at their buying desk that could regularly depress the price of wheat. So what are farmers gonna do about that? Well, one of the things the Western Canadian farmers did was build their own damn elevators, right? 
and try to get around that system and have professionals in charge of marketing the week. And that's part of a bigger picture of how co-ops evolved in agriculture to respond to economic pressures. And we have a whole bunch of different types. So these are all attempts to eliminate the middleman, right? And you might not have thought about your credit union as a middleman eliminator, but in a way it is, right? You become, you and all your neighbors become your own banker. And uh, this is just a, a quick list, and I didn't fact check this, I didn't, didn't, uh, I didn't download the company's statements and, and check them myself, but apparently these are the 10 biggest agriculture cooperatives. Kind of an interesting list, it turns out uh, Land Lakes, Arla, Fonterra, DFA, uh, Friesland are all basically dairy cooperatives. Uh, Bayware is a Korean energy company, especially in solar and wind. Uh, CHS is uh, an American a conglomerate of basically ag inputs, fertilizer, fuel, agronomy services, and Zenno is a, is a Japanese agriculture machinery builder and supplier. Would CHS be like an FDN or would it be like a CDN like that? Yeah, it's like mm, so they own like refineries, so they're, they're uh, there may be closest equivalent would be like Canada, Canada's Federated Co-op, but on an American size scale. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I got a right. So let's let's look at these a bit more. So this is how, in the 20th century, farmers tried to um, try to to eliminate the middle, the intermediary by cooperating amongst themselves. So in financing, and you can think of that, the investment capital as an input for your farm. Okay? Farming is very capital intensive and is fairly risky. So just borrowing money to run a farm is not easy. And so we have a regulated environment now, which we've, we've sought politically where farm protection against uh, bankruptcy, right? There's farm debt review boards and things that prevent uh, uh, foreclosures on farms. Uh, governments will back a portion of a farm loan. There's uh, important ways that farmers have either by, uh, in the policy environment and also by forming their own cooperative uh, credit unions have been become significant players in the financial inputs. The credit union story is interesting. I think, someone from St. Malo here, I don't think so. Uh, the first credit union in Manitoba was in St. Malo, where the local priest learned of a farmer that had paid $5,000 in interest on an original loan of $150 he had taken to buy food. So that reminds you of of your credit card debt, and uh, you know, we'll learn about financial management more. And so the first loan that Credit Union actually had a financial purchase of a cream separator, that would allow a farm to take a very uh, shelf unstable product, cow's milk, separate off the cream, which is relatively stable, can be stored long enough to be sold. Right? Remember this is before refrigeration. So you know, you're going from a product that has a shelf life of days to a product that has a shelf life of weeks. And so uh, the butter fat can be, can be saved. Not, you prefer bread rather than hot, but maybe below, slightly below ambient temperature, like maybe in an ice house or something. Uh, be saved and then eventually uh, shipped and, and uh, Eaton's or some company turned into butter. And so fairly uh, high return on a low investment. The co-ops in agriculture 
tend to have done very well if they're on the upstream side, if they're in the pre-production phase of the value chain, they're rocking it. If you are on the downstream side, where you're processing or retailing, it's been pretty flat. So you've probably heard the expression, there's no money in agriculture, but there's all kinds of money around agriculture, right? And you can kind of see that a little bit, right? The people that are selling stuff to farms are doing good. And so um, the growth in agri-co-ops has been on the input side. More and more people are seeking to try to do business with uh, a competitive uh, co-op. Why does a co-op work? It's essentially economies of scale. So, <laughs> okay guys, with only three of us or four of us here, uh, you know, either, it, like, I'm gonna hear you if you whisper. <laughs> so if you got something really important to say, just say it. <laughs> uh, otherwise, maybe not. So, uh, and remember, this is, we're all on, uh, this is being recorded for posterity. The uh, economies of scale are why these co-ops work, right? You just try to market your own grain directly, no one's interested. You put a, every, all the grain from your local community in an elevator and try to sell it. You have something that could be a bit of a player. Same with something like the Federated Cooperative being the largest refiner of, of gasoline and diesel in Western Canada. They're big enough to make a difference. Now, in a free market, the participation of that co-op doesn't immediately change things. I know uh, every year when we have our BMA annual meeting, someone always stands up and says, well, if, why is this co-op not paying us more? We're only getting basically the market price. And at least part of the reason is that that co-op is part of what's setting the market price. Right? The BMA is paying out three bucks, Everyone else has to pay out three bucks too. So the ec the you know if you're up in the ag business department trying to figure out to what effect co-ops do uh, affect the economy, you got to understand there's a feedback mechanism there that's going to tend to reduce that overall impact. So in the 20s, there was uh, three uh, wheat pools. And within about uh, five years of their first formation, nearly half of all farmers' grain went to those, those pools. Probably tells you the farmers weren't super happy with where they were dealing with before. Uh, and those cooperatives tended to not only see themselves as being businesses, but also to advocate for the farmers' interests. So much so, that the cooperative of the United Farmers of Manitoba actually got involved in electoral politics and actually won the provincial election. And so asked John Bracken, who at that time was basically the, the president of what the program we're in here, to be premier. So uh, we always, you know, we're hiring a new director of the School of Agriculture. We always, you know, it's a test question. Are you ready to be premier? Because it could happen, right? Uh, and so that once they were elected, they said, well, we can't just be uh, a co-op anymore. And so they ran as the progressive party. How did they grow? Because once they got started, they tended to buy up both uh, processing and the line elevators. And uh, the last purchases by uh, uh, the, the major co-ops of elevators was when uh, the pools bought the Scottish Cooperative Society. You ever heard of that? What do you think that business did? Catered to Scottish people. Well, yeah. And which Scottish people? For the Scottish farmers in Manitoba? Yes. Okay. And this was actually a co-op in Scotland that ran a grain mill there 
and were deliberately sourcing Canadian wheat to supply themselves. So a co-op over in Scotland owned grain elevators in Manitoba, mostly in eastern Manitoba, Beausjour and Steinbeck and areas. And then they transported to the east coast and ship it over, or would they go to the Hudson Bay? Uh, I don't think Hudson's Bay was an option at that time. No. Yeah, yeah unless they would have put in a canoe. Yeah. Thunder Bay. Be through. I would think Thunder Bay, but it could have also been through the U.S. So, uh, that's, they, they, they grew largely through acquisition, and then eventually all of those, uh, those, those pools don't exist anymore, they were all sold. And it's interesting to think about, well, disintermediation is such a great thing, why are those pools not still thriving businesses? And uh, the transparent marketplaces reduced, like they had their effect, they changed the grain markets forever. And those, if once other private firms started competing on the same basis, it was less imperative to deal with the pool. So, and as farmers had more choice, the supply chain became an expensive liability. And in fact, uh, you know, this is not all of anything that's a surprise to you guys, but 90% of the elevators in Western Canada closed in the last 70 years or so. So that all those assets they purchased gradually became worthless. And the capital requirements of building modern elevators for a non-profit organization was very hard to motivate. So gradually it was private investment that took over the grain elevation business. So that's on the input side, the co-ops. What about on the output side? So that would be marketing co-ops. Uh, lots of local food cooperatives popping up across Canada. Uh, and it tends to be smaller groups of farmers. My farmer's market would be an example, right? That's a co-op of farmers choosing to exert its efforts and, and cost together to market rather than individually. Like the, the co-op grocery stores too, like that mm -hmm. those ones started at this time? Yeah. Uh, well, I think they started, I don't actually, I don't really know the history there, to be honest with you. Um, I guess it's 50s and 60s, but I don't know. So, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to get more than half of your final selling price rather than less. And so, you know, and, and marketing can be surprisingly expensive. And so we do our marketing assignment, you guys will start budgeting for that and go, oh yeah. Okay. So if you can share those costs, that's a, that's a win. So let's just uh, think about we're all we're all farmers here. Uh, what's a co-op you do business with? Why do you do business with them? We think about. I mean, I uh, I've tried to talk students over the years into doing a co-op as a startup business. Like if you're starting a business, why not do it as a co-op? Can we cook up some ideas together here for that? So who does I I use a credit union. I use the Be Made Honey Co-op. I buy my, oh, my fuel from the Starbucks, I guess not the Starbucks co-op anymore, it's the, they've amalgamated so many times I forget the name, Harvest. Starbucks co-op, Starbucks. Starbucks, okay, how about you guys? Uh, fuel from St. Leon co-op. Yeah. Um, I guess sometimes we get chemical and maybe some seed from FDN, mm -hmm. that's a co-op. Um, all of our groceries mostly come from co-op grocery store in town. Okay. Um, we do business with two different credit unions. Mm -hmm. um, Did you ever think about those when you do that business with those organizations as this complicated disintermediation, or you just that's where we like to do it? Uh, I don't know. 
<laughs> okay? So I, don't think so I think that was five. Can anyone beat that? He's got five co-ops. Can anyone beat that? No. I have zero. Zero? Can anyone beat that? Might be a point. Okay, well that's that's surprisingly low. Fencing supplies from an egg co-op. Yeah, okay. Six. So you're the winner. There's definitely more. Is Cap co-op? Or Keystone Egg Producers? No. That's a producer association. Okay. Kind of, I mean, it's also, I think, a nonprofit, but it doesn't do business. Right? It's right. An, an advocacy group. It's kind of a well, different thing. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a link here if you wanted to think about some crazy co ops. Uh, so Mountain Equipment Co op is a, is a co op, right? Selling, essentially competing with Bass Pro. Um, Stocksy is a co-op of photographers who sell stock uh, photography. Where you just take random pictures and you hope that one day someone might want that photo for an ad for a website or something, and then you license it out. And uh, like the private firms that do that are very exploitive. So, you know, no one has come up with a co-op uh, to compete with Spotify, but that seems like maybe because every recording artist complains about how little they get for that. It was, I guess LimeWire and them wouldn't have been that. They were a uh, ripoff, right? <laughs> yeah. they, they paid the artist nothing. <laughs> so Spotify paying you one cent seemed like an improvement. Um, and uh, yeah, Saskatoon is a really cool bulk retail food uh, supplied entirely by local producers. Um, there is a couple more on that list, one of which sells adult goods. There's a co-op in downtown Toronto that sells things you might need for, for personal recreation, let's say. Uh, can anyone think of, if we were to think of a really weird co-op that no one's thought of before? Something that you buy, or something you think people buy lots of, that you could employ the economies of scale in order to do better. Some restaurant co op or something? Sure, it could be. A, uh, well, there are some restaurants that are, although, like Mondragon used to be what they called a workers co op that was owned by the, the people that ran it, but I don't think it's open anymore. Isn't West Jack kind of like that? The workers are the owners? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> that's, that's just what their advertising yeah. says. That's what they call <laughs> And that, now, interesting example, because uh, airlines super capital and uh, investment heavy, right? Like each one of those planes is hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. So uh, probably not a great co-op option because you know, your pilots and your stewards, you know, who's gonna have the hundreds of millions of dollars to buy the plane? Right? Um, any other suggestions? Let's get one each. Crazy co-op. Co-op of scrap metal. Okay, rather than selling to the shredder at whatever price they decide to give you, yeah. I don't know. I'm just picking How about on campus food? Yeah. Right. Why are we just taking whatever they give us? The bar on campus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Control. Student union bar. Uh, this, the student union used to own the food facilities at that, that's why it's all in the student union building. Right. And they gradually kind of lost control of it. Partly because it's really hard to run something if every four years your yeah. management graduates, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the, so, yeah, those you, when I was a student, the bar was still in the room. What was it called at the time? Was it Wise Guys? The four Wise Guys. It was just the Om Zu Zero. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got one? No. No? What's the last thing you bought? Uh, 
Yeah, the beer. Beer. Last night. Why isn't there a beer cola? There should be. Let's do it. Okay, well. So the question would be for your beer co-op, can you, by having a shorter supply chain, produce a better product more cheaply with better return to the farms than your competitors? And I would suggest probably because like we certainly see lots of these brew pubs and so, like they're, they're killing it up there. Like they're, the amount of market share they're stealing from the major breweries is, is substantial. Yeah, so like, would a farm cooperative brewer have an even greater market advantage? Possibly. Is farmery kind of like that, or no? farmery is a private like as much as it is only private. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about it a bit already, but this economic term is disintermediation, which is not uh, ignoring the. Uh, you know, family counselor when they're trying to mediate your dispute, but rather is a willing middleman. Um, so you're trying to reach those customers directly or at least further along the supply chain. And this word's become sort of a buzzword because over the last 20 years, we've seen how very successful companies have done this using the internet, right? So Amazon, huge, this intermediate, okay? They have, why go to, uh, down to the, the local store to buy your extension cord when you can buy it from an Amazon website and have it shipped directly from the factory where it's made? So, when we bring this back to our farms, if you think about what is the potential for what our farm produces being the kind of thing where the middle person is vulnerable, that there is an opportunity to disintermediate. And that would be much less true for some types of products than others. So if you want to be a bulk producer and have a very sim a simple and straightforward uh, selling plan where you're participating in the transparent marketplace, not a good candidate, right? Christmas trees, where everyone buys at most one a year, and once it's about 25 below and they've walked a quarter mile, they don't get a crap about the quality of the price anymore. Uh, pretty good opportunity, right? So not not every business has the same kind of squeeze available to it. So, and when you take on this data deviation, then you take on all the jobs that those middle people were going to do, right? And the, the, I think the biggest one for most, that's relevant to most farm products, is going to be the market. How are you going to reach that marketplace? And there are some, there are some really good ideas, right? You can actually, like there are websites whose jobs are selling products. You know, have you thought about listing your flour with Amazon? And then you deliver a truckload of flour bags once a month to an Amazon warehouse and yeah. they take it from there. Isn't there one in Winnipeg here now? No, because I think we weren't corrupt enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think Calgary yes. made it rain and they, they got it. Yeah. Something like you won't ever have to pay land taxes ever. Yeah. That's probably a deal that Amazon is usually looking for. Not that they're gonna do anything. Yeah, it's at least nice to know up front that you're never gonna collect rather than yeah. after the fact, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you have so what kind of things would be good to sell through Amazon? Um, Non-perishables. Okay, long shelf life. Can be food, mm -hmm. but they don't want to sell something that has to be refrigerated, right? Mm -hmm. um, although something like Uber Eats would be something that possibly would sell uh, short shelf life food products. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, there's different different opportunities out there. Um, Uber Eats is also what? a very limited range. Uh, so you'd want a nice ratio of value to weight, 
Right? You got something that's worth you know, only a few cents a pound, and you know it's gonna cost you a buck a pound to ship it, then it's not gonna work, right? So you want a high value, nice, you know, so boxes of feathers you know, are a great product, whereas, uh, you know, anvils, not so much. So, what does this look like in modern agriculture? So there's lots of disintermediation going on. Relatively little of it is being driven by farmers. That's the reality. Okay. So we have lots of companies that used to be thought of as sort of post-production getting into actual production. They want to control the uh, actual production stage. So whether you have you know, maple leaf in the hog industry, um, I think to a certain extent the potato industry is, you know, those are the hard contracts where you're growing what they specify for them. Um, and so that's that, that company reaching back in the supply chain and trying to control more of that. Not necessarily bad, I don't think. Uh, I think you can, you can create efficiency by doing that. Uh, it's probably efficiency being created for that company yeah. rather than the producer, yeah. right? <laughs> So, for instance, Walmart uh, has, a couple of years ago, said they have a long-term strategy of being the uh, single largest intermediary for vegetables and fruit. That they want to have 60 to 70% of all fresh foods sold through their supply chain. Which is kind of scary, I think, because with that kind of percentage, uh, they would have uh, the capacity to manipulate the market. Won't the algal feed loss kick in at some point though? Say that again? Or wouldn't the wouldn't, uh, anti-competitive laws kick in? Mm, you would hope so, but I'm not optimistic. Fair enough. Uh, and I think even something like the right to repair issues going on with like John Deere, right? Mm -hmm. That is an attempt to make sure that you always are paying their mechanic and that's yeah. those. I think Apple's worse than John Deere actually. Well, basically the same thing. To a farmer, yeah. right? John Deere. Yeah. And certainly the money is much higher with John Deere. Yeah. Right? Like Apple's, Apple does, they have started selling their uh, tools to repair their phones, but the tools are way more expensive than like a screen repair for a phone. Would be. So how about a phone repair co-op? I, mean, I guess, yeah. There's also so you can yeah. buy the tools, the Apple tools once, and repair crap loads of phones instead of... Doesn't some cans do that? They're not cool. They're not cool. I guess right. so, right. So you find yourself, the value chain is shortening whether we like it or not. And I suggest farms are going to have to think about the extent to which they want to be part of that and be remain in control of the production or not. So where is your farm going to fit in the, in the future? Or is the value chain not going to include the producer? Are you essentially going to be a contract employee? So, you know, this course is value added. Is value added the same thing as disintermediation, or is it different things? Like you're, you're shaking your head, what's the difference? Well, as you kind of explained at the start, uh, I guess, um, there's bigger companies that can do it way cheaper than you might be able to. Mm -hmm. um, well, remember how we defined value added at the beginning of the year, right? right? By further processing, traceability, and various other processes, right. you make the product be worth more. Right. Uh, is that the same thing as disintermediating, or is it a different thing? So if we're, one thing is like disintermediation, that's eliminating steps in the value chain. Well, you're value added is yeah, you're your farm doing more of the value chain. You 
just gain another step in the value chain. Mm -hmm. Six. Uh, Steps are still happening. It's just you, you got, you, you got the ability to do it okay. again. So. One thing I'd ask you to think of, though, is there are things the value chain currently isn't doing, or there are opportunities to add value. So, for instance, something like you know identity preservation. That you know, say your beef is worth more to McDonald's if you participate in their environmental stewardship program. Uh, that's adding new value that's not currently part of the value chain. Mm -hmm. And only your farm can do that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that there is a complete overlap of these concepts. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah that's what you You can draw a Venn yeah. diagram with them on your side. Yeah, yeah, if we draw the Venn diagram, we're going to have you know one circle that's value added. One circle, we're imagining this here for things at home. Okay. On certain produce. And now how big is that space in between? Is it almost complete overlap? It's pretty just big. a sliver? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm thinking too. Yeah. Cool. Probably the greatest opportunity is to do this is online. And two two concepts here, B2C and B2B. That's business to consumer and business to business sales, right? So most Modern farms are business to business businesses, right? What you're selling your product to another business, you're not selling it to a consumer. Uh, but running uh, an, some sort of online sales platform create, I guess, much lower cost than having any sort of bricks and mortar operation, or even quite frankly, a roadside stand, right? You don't have to pay anybody the consumer clicks the buttons and makes the payments. And that creates uh, huge opportunities to eliminate value chain steps. So you have to think about whether your farm product is going to be the kind of thing that would sell well online, and what platform would you use to do that. So for instance, my farm, I sell honey and cannabis. Honey is really heavy, and it's got a good price right now. But traditionally, it's been uh, it's sort of it's sort of weight to value ratio hasn't meant you could ever make money shipping it through a UPS system or something. Candles, nice and light, and worth lots of money. So you can sell candles online pretty readily, as many people do. Right. In fact, one reason I haven't bought is because it looks like that market's pretty saturated. Um, so you think about your own product. Am I selling the kind of thing that a people would order online, would be able to find, and that if I shipped it, uh, I could actually get a decent, like, could I ship it for less than I could retail it? I mean, when you go down to uh, Safeway and they say, sure, we'll take your, uh, your bags of baby potatoes, but we want 60%. And his listing fees, and buy that, and discounts and everything, and so that you're actually looking at like thirty percent of the final price. So, well, I don't know that roadside stands aren't going to look pretty good, right? And if you looked at at uh, that grocery store's books, their margin is actually pretty thin. Like, yeah, they're taking sixty percent of everything they're selling, but it's a really expensive business to run. Think about having you know a big store with 20 or 30 people working there for 80, 90 hours a week, right? Like that's not cheap. And we know we know that because those stores are getting killed by Amazon. <laughs> so yeah, Zellers is coming back though. <laughs> that's a good sign. Good sign of what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the apocalypse, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry if anyone's uh, grandma worked at Zellers. Uh, <laughs> no hard feelings, but uh, 
<laughs> so, uh, a couple more examples for you. First of all, the Oreo cookies. You can buy an Oreo subscription service. You sign up and they'll send you a bag of Oreo cookies once a month. And you only have to give them your credit card number once. You can buy a subscription service for watches. Yeah, there's all, so subscriptions are a great uh, sort of sales opportunity because you only have the transaction cost once. And you only have to recruit that customer once. And until they unclick, until they, you know, go scroll all the way down to your email to find the unsubscribe yeah. button, uh, they're sending you 20, 30 bucks a month or for watches, maybe it's $1,000 a month, right? I think the person who wants the watches and the person who subscribes to the Oreos, probably very different people, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I suspect the watch is what daughters buy their fathers that are very, very rich, right? Yeah. yeah. Here, Daddy, thanks for buying me the Lamborghini. Here's a new watch every month. People that can afford a Hello Fresh. <laughs> so, uh, HelloFresh is a lot cheaper than a watch. Yeah, right? I know. And then the other, uh, another example of, of a very interesting case of disintermediation is when Amazon bought Whole Foods. Okay. So a very large grocery retailer, and Amazon's bought them as a way to move grocery online by buying a trusted high quality, high perceived quality food retailer. And now they're offering all those same products online. And if you're a prime customer, then they'll ship it to you in six hours or less. So why go out? And, and of course you can imagine that, without a whole lot of imagination, that something like the pandemic just accelerated this massively, right? That, uh, when people weren't allowed to go outside, these online sales just ballooned. For, uh, like when we're trying to measure the opportunity here, one of the things I always encourage you to look for is are there places in the world that are doing more of something than we are in Manitoba? Right? We're a little bit of a backwater, we're slow to change. The trends get here last. And some of the worst trends never get here at all. I, I don't think that's a bad thing. But if you're a, a person looking for a new business idea, one good piece of advice I'd give you is, you know, get on a plane and go somewhere cool and see what they're doing. Come back and do it here first. But at the same time, don't do something that's never gonna catch on here. Like surfboard rentals. Why would surfboard rentals be a job? I guess the other class you're talking about, I think it was Shops and Morris or something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so just not enough customer base. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. That's more of those. So, looking, when I went to look it up, there's places in Asia and in particular China where 20% or more of food is purchased online compared to about a quarter of that in North America. So it looks like there's like 15% of a market opportunity there. People are gonna, your generation's gonna buy more food online than any generation previous. Might not be you guys, but it's gonna be people your age. And why would our farms not wanna be a part of that? And that might mean that you have to sign up a deal with, with Amazon. That's statistic include like Uber Eats and stuff though? Or is that correct? Uh, but food online. Uh, good question. Does that include prepared food or raw food? Yeah. Uh, five point five seems like a stretch for all groceries online. But I mean I, I don't know. So never mind. Yeah. I'll have to go back to the source on that. I I, I wouldn't want to speculate. It could be groceries, they don't do that. So, well, and make sure we're comparing the same thing, right? Yeah. So it says online grocery sales, 5.5%. .5%. You have the 20% of food online includes 
restaurant delivery, right. and we're not comparing apples to apples, right? right. The source, uh, I don't think, would have made that mistake, and they're just being a bit economical with their words here. I think they do mean groceries in both cases. Okay. So, but I uh, confess that I didn't like triple check that. That's, yeah. Okay, and so for sources, uh, this agriculture.com article, The Future of Fewer Middlemen, and also an excellent article from the Ontario Minister of Agriculture called Value Chains, are two things worth looking at if you want to think a bit more about how this content would affect your individual project. Are there any questions? Okay, should we go eliminate some pizzas? Good All right, thanks a lot. You're speaking my language. Thank <laughs> you.